the first point on my page is just to mention that a catechesis is well understood as, and here's a definition, a dialogue of faith between believers. So catechesis is about growing in faith, deepening our faith, and strengthening the practice of our faith. So it's distinct in that sense, obviously, from evangelization or from a first proclamation of the gospel. It is an exchange, uh, a mutual encouragement, explanation certainly, a reaching for deeper understanding among those who already enjoy the gift of faith. Now the particular theme, I'm going to move through these things quickly so that there's more time for conversation. The particular theme of this section of the Holy Year, the Year of Faith Catechesis, is living life to the full. So this is about how we understand our human be- ourselves as human beings. It's about the Christian understanding of the human person. How do I see myself? How do I understand myself? When I look in the mirror in the morning, what does that mean? What is the value and the worth and the purpose? All of those questions. I mightn't feel like facing them first thing in the morning, but I will behave during the day on the basis of what, in fact, I have taken on board and, as it were, built into my standard reactions as I go through the day. So whether we know it or not, we do have a fundamental understanding of what it is to be a human person. Sometimes it's, well, a human being is intrinsically a bit of a mess, and I'm just like that. Or a human being is a, cre- you know, a creature that has come to life basically to gain as much pleasure and satisfaction out of life as possible. Or whatever it is. But we act out of a set of presuppositions. And it's those that Christian moral theology wants to examine and question and refine and deepen. So underneath all of this, there is that question. Who do I think that I am? How do I see and understand myself? Because out of that then comes all the issues of morality, of the choice that we make, and these can be a whole long list. The only one of this list that I'm going to talk about very briefly this evening is sexuality and sexual behaviour. Not least because that's the one that people often puzzle over and are curious about or don't understand or whatever. But underneath all of this, there is a single assertion of the Christian faith which is absolutely crucial. And it's this, that we are made for happiness. Or in a more sophisticated word, we are made for beatitude, for that wonder fulfillment that is summed up in a way in that word so we are not made without purpose we are not made simply to run our course and then disappear like the snuff the snuffing of a candle we are made for an eternal beatitude and obviously that we will find in the presence of god and it's that that fulfills us that is our ultimate purpose and it's that sense of calling to happiness calling to beatitude which shapes and should shape the decisions the patterns that form our daily living you might remember that when pope benedict was here in 2009 that was when most of us were about 14 years of age if you're still in the right mindset uh, he talked to young people at twickenham And that was the theme he took. And he said, he suggested in his very gentle way, that often the decisions that we take, nearly all of which are our attempt to find what we think will make us happy, often are short-term or mistaken. So you think about it. A, A choice that you make, almost any choice that you make, will be to do with pursuing happiness or avoiding pain, avoiding distress. And that, as it were, is the way we're built. What the Christian faith tries to do is to define those things more clearly 
so that we do not go off too often down the cul-de-sacs, whatever they might be, celebrity, drugs, drink, sleep, whatever, avoidance, lies, whatever. But all of those, all of those we believe at that moment are what will make me feel better, okay, content, myself, whatever. So the dynamic of human living, the dynamic of seek seeking the fullness of life is at its simplest form the pursuit of what we believe will make us happy, what will give us that beatitude. And of course the Pope, in speaking in Twickenham, used the word holiness as, as it were, the simplest expression of the true happiness to which we are called. So you will remember, I'm sure, he invited young people to see themselves as the saints of the 21st century. Why? Because in that holiness, in that relationship with God, lies our happiness, lies our true, profound, and lasting contentment. Only God can satisfy our deepest needs, and what our true contentment, where it is found, is when we come to share in the glory of God. Now, to bring it up to this week, that's the point of the Feast of the Ascension that we've just celebrated. That's its point, that Jesus, in ascending and returning to his Father, is showing us our destination and is showing us the way. So when we, however we imagine the ascension, and there are those wonderful pictures of a pair of feet just disappearing at the top of the picture. But if we listen to St. Luke's account, then Jesus is actually, as he were, setting us on our way. The last thing that he does is he blesses the disciples and sends them into the town of Jerusalem to say, get on with it. Get on with living as I have taught you. And remember, I am with you always. So, just as Jesus' heart was always set on doing the Father's will, so we, if we're to find this pathway to happiness, have the same mindset, the same heart set of wanting to do the Father's will. Next step. The Father's will is sketched out for us in the moral law. And that is expressed in all sorts of different ways, and it is explored in all sorts of different ways. But it is the gift of faith for us to hold that the teaching of the church is a sure guide of the moral law that is our best way of attaining to happiness. And that is a huge step for me and for every person to take to move from sensing, seeing, believing, feeling, thinking that any moral law is an imposition on me, which is a constraint, which limits my freedom, which boxes me in, which tells me everything that I can't do, to shift from that to an understanding that the law is a true guide and that it is interpreting for me in the details of action how I am to live because of who I am and because of what my vocation, my destiny really is to be. And if we're involved in catechesis, if we're involved with working with young people, if we can approach that turning point, then we really are beginning to grow in faith and to have a sense that the moral life is not the observance of a negative law, but the pursuit of beatitude, the pursuit of happiness. And, and to get people over that hump, as it were, is a huge step and a big work of catechesis. As Pope Francis said just recently, to be attentive to the Holy Spirit to be attentive to the moral law sometimes demands that we change our plans. And that too, I think, has got a whole wealth 
of meaning in it that we could explore. Why would we want to change our plans? What is going to support us and help us in that taking of a pathway that might not be the first one that we would want and the first one we would choose for ourselves? Now, let me try and illustrate a little bit of that by talking about sex and sexuality. And so immediately, I want to talk about a virtue. I want to talk about the virtue of chastity, which is basically, the virtue of chastity is the correct use of our sexuality and of our bodies. So we're going to talk about the practice of a virtue. And the practice of a virtue is always that the, it comes with the habits of mind and heart that then get translated into practice. If you think the word virtue, then think for a minute of the word virtuoso. So you could think of a virtuoso violin performance or a guitarist or a midfield footballer or whatever you like. But a virtuoso performance is the display of virtue. Not necessarily moral virtue, but the notion of virtue is very similar. It is doing something to the highest level, almost without thinking about it, because it has become, as it were, my habit. So moral virtue is doing what is right of habit, even when nobody is watching. So when we act in a virtuous manner, and as an expression of the virtue, the practice, as it were, the understanding that we have, then we're not doing it because we're being observed, because we're under scrutiny, because there's a whole set of rules and laws and regulations that tell us what we must do. The, the, the practice of virtue comes from within, because it has, as it were, I've appropriated to myself an understanding and a desire and a will to act in this way because I know that is the pathway of my beatitude, of my happiness. The virtue of chastity, as I say, is to do with the use of sex. Now, sex is an interesting word. I mean, etymologically, of course, it's got all sorts of other interests. But it comes actually from the Latin word meaning to divide. So an, an English word that comes from the same root is section. So this section of the room as against that section of the room. So sex is about what, how we have been divided, male and female. And therefore, actually, the use of sex is about bringing disparate parts together in a complementarity that they have in order, as it were, to, to get to that sense of what is whole. Sex, obviously, is an activity of the body. The bringing together of the separate faculties that create something that is whole. Because, it's, we're, because we're physical, that is to do with our physical attributes. And so sex is always to do with the body. But it's more than the body because it's to do with our emotions, our spirit, our soul, it's to do with our whole person. And what our understanding of sexuality is, and it's the deeply human one, is that we express ourselves in intimacy in a way that is the most powerful bodily expression in a creative sense that we have. We can express ourselves physically in anger or destructiveness, but that's not bringing two halves together. That is, as it were, developing and deepening and, and seeing the destructiveness of division. But when we're talking about the intimacy of physical sex, then we're talking about something which is about the whole of me. It's about how I feel, it's about my body, it's about my soul, it's about absolutely the inner core of myself. So sexual activity, sexual intercourse is a language. It's a way of communicating. It's an openness. It's a giving. It's a receiving. 
and it is the deepest that we have and it is a language and a gift of self and a reception of another which as best we can is total. So I would say the fundamental truth about sexual morality is that in using that language, in using that facility, we never lie. We do not express in the language of total giving and receiving something that is quite different from what the language actually means. So we, as it were, recognize that this language of the person is the language of a total self-giving and therefore it belongs in marriage when those promises of exclusive love of one for another have been made and where it all makes sense. Now there's another thing which everybody knows which is when you bring two sexes together, male and female, then they have the potential to create new life. And that's the wonder of our bodies, that all that is required for the creation of new life is already within us, male and female. And bring them together and then you have not only the language of total self-giving one to another, but you have the language and the action of the creation of new life. And again we say, do not lie. Do not deliberately exclude that part of the language. Do not, as you were, cut it out and put it over to one side. And that's the second reason why in the church's teaching, sexual intercourse belongs in marriage, for it is that cooperation of father and mother and God in the creation of a new person. And therefore, that's what drives the uh, teaching of the church to see and insist that because this is about the creation of new life, then it calls forth from us a permanence so that that new life may be nurtured and seen through to maturity. So chastity is the virtue of never telling lies with our bodies and with what we do with them. IVF takes the coming together of the sexes of the bodies away from the creation of new life and puts that new life into the laboratory. Abortion takes away the gift of that life, as does euthanasia. So it's all of that understanding of the value of life, respect for human life from its first beginnings to its natural end. Okay, one example of where a sense of who we are, what the human person is made of for, begins to unfold in a particular area of moral decision making and moral living. Now, I'm going to stop in another three or four minutes. Let me kind of sum up uh, as much as I can, very briefly, by saying this. The truth of who we are is told in the truth of Jesus and in the main mysteries and events of his life. So in the incarnation of Christ, we learn of the goodness of humanity. We learn that we are made in the image and likeness of God. For the person of Jesus in human body is the real presence of the divine. We, are so, we learn again that we are body and soul, intellect and will. But in Jesus, without sin. Not in us, because we are divided within ourselves. We learn of those things. They are, as it were, encapsulated for us and shown in their full extent in the person of Jesus, the incarnate, eternal Word of God, as it were, shining a light on the deepest meaning of who we are. In his passion and death, we come to see and have to come to terms with the fact that we are not sinless. And that what we do out of our broken selves 
is crucify the sinless one. The crucifixion, the death of Jesus, is what happens when pure love stands among us. Anything that is totally pure will spark hatred against it because it shows us up for who we really are. So the passion and death of Jesus shows us our sinfulness, but it also takes us beyond it because in the cross, as we know, there is the overcoming of that hatred, the, as it were, the breaking of the cycle of sin, and therefore that is the source of redemption to which we go. So, as we know in our daily lives, anger is normally met with anger. Revenge is normally met with further revenge. What Jesus does is to break that continuing cycle and absorb it all into himself. And that's why the crucifix becomes the source of our redemption. And the resurrection. Real bodily resurrection. Telling us that our body will rise again on the last day. Telling us that the fulfillment of God's purpose is in the transformation, the new creation of everything that he has first created. And that this then, this understanding of the bodily resurrection becomes the source of our respect for our own, own body. Never as an instrument for me to use as I wish, never simply as a surface that is to be decorated in this way or that, but as something which is part of God's plan and to be fulfilled and raised up to share in the heavenly divinity of Christ. So, incarnation, passion and death, resurrection and the ascension. Where the head has gone, there we are to follow ourselves. Our destiny spelt out. And then finally, Pentecost. Pentecost making us other Christs through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, the invitation of the ascension becomes a possibility for us. For we are constituted in a totally new relationship with the Father, in a totally new relationship with each other as we become brother and sister, and we are constituted in this union with Christ who holds and supports and leads us always. Incarnation, death and resurrection, ascension, uh, death and passion and death, resurrection, ascension and Pentecost. Each one telling us the truth about ourselves which then unfolds into the moral life leading us to the fullness of our beatitude. Now already within our grasp to, but to be fulfilled in heaven in God's own good time. Uh, <laughs> the, the gift of the soul is the work of God. So the short answer is, please ask God. Uh, but no, no. Um, a person brought to life is given the gift of a soul. Um, but as best we know, and I think the safe position that the church takes is to say that is from the moment of conception. Okay, so frozen gametes are frozen. They're not, that's before conception. But the, the, the safe, the, as I say, the, the prudent position that the church takes is to say that God gives the gift of the soul as that human life begins. Uh, the, you know, a moment of conception is not life with the potential to become human, as some would like us to believe, but it is human life with potential to, to grow to maturity. So it's from that point that you say, this has the characteristic of human life, and one of those characteristics is a God-given eternal soul. One of the amazing and fantastic things about Catholic teaching on human life 
is that it gives hope to whoever is born, whether they be with a disability or not. And one of the things that I always like to highlight in any such opening is that if, as a Catholic community, we give such hope to the presence of disabled people um, in all that we do and all that we are as human people and as church, um, a facility such as this would be an absolutely amazing place for the person with disability to be present at. So my request as this opens is that you don't forget the presence of disabled people um, in our church and that we celebrate the gift I was reading an article the other day and, and the point was very powerfully made. Um, the exclusion of people with disabilities, either through abortion or through isolation, is a very clear and unambiguous act of prejudice and inequality. So, you know, if the two, as it were, standards that our society likes to think it carries uh, a freedom of prejudice and an equality banner, then you say, well, how does that work with abortion? How does that work with an attitude towards disability that would want to say that's a reason for ending, terminating, denying a person a life? So that, that I think the, what you've said illustrates how the church tries in practice to exercise a freedom from prejudice and a genuine commitment to equality with regard to those who are, have disabilities here. Yeah. For this year of faith, how would you go about really uh, witnessing to the faith in their own lives and really getting the most out of it? And secondly, do you have a message for anyone going to World Youth Day this summer? Um, well, I think you know the, the invitation of the Holy Father for the year of faith was in the first place for us to deepen our faith, to enter more, as it were, thoroughly through the doorway of faith. And, and I think that's an invitation that holds good every morning. I tell you, for me, the most consoling words spoken by a saint are these. They're words which are attributed, I assume that, you know, attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. And the words attributed to him as he was dying, you know, his, his, the circumstances of his death as they're accounted are quite dramatic because he, he lived in utter simplicity. But as he approached death, he asked his brethren, this new community that he'd formed, to take him off his bed and to lie him on the earth of the place where they lived. And it is said that he looked round and he said these words, brethren, let us begin to love the Lord, because so far we have made little progress. Now, I find that very consoling. <laughs> if St. Francis can say that, then I can say it too. And I can say it every morning, and I can start again. And I think the, the focus of the year of faith is that every morning we enter more, deter more you know, purposefully, through the door of faith to live with and in Christ in the actions of that day. And, you know, what might we want to achieve? How would we best express our faith? It is through the way we live. It is through the way we live. It's through how we behave. Again, to go back to St. Francis, preach the gospel always. Preach the gospel always, he says. And if necessary, use words. So preach the gospel always by what we do. And that's the most compelling testimony, I, I do believe. And what was your last, this, the last bit was, a oh, World Youth Day. He's not, I was going to ask, has he gone? The, the, yeah. the priest from Brazil. Um, well, I, you know, at one level I could say, please, please, please drink plenty of water. <laughs> I could say that, because that's going to be crucial. Um, I've only been to Rio once, and uh, there's a beach, as everybody knows, called the Copacabana Beach, and there's another beach around the corner. Now, I think it's a long time ago, it was called the Ipanema Beach, or the... Ipanema. 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 <laughs> well, I'd just like you to know, I nearly drowned swimming in the sea there. <laughs> 
So please be very careful if you go in the sea. Just remember the fact that you nearly didn't have me because it was, it was very, there's an, a terrific undercurrent, a terrific undercurrent that pulls you out and it's scary, it was scary. It's true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so be very careful if you... Now, otherwise, I would say enter into the invitation and the experience of World Youth Day um, wholeheartedly. Not, not foolishly, but wholeheartedly. And I think that means... It does mean getting out and meeting people from other countries and, uh, as it were, getting a feel for the universality of the church and for the appeal of faith. And I'm quite sure, I'm quite sure it'll be a, a, an amazing experience, not least because of, the, of, of the, the vitality and the freshness that Pope Francis is bringing to his ministry. And he'll be on home territory, of course. So, I mean, do go through the websites and read what he speaks, because he speaks in a, particularly, a particular way. And, and I think it would be no harm at all to get used to the kind of language that he uses, the images that he uses, because I'm sure he'll be doing that there. And as far as I can see, they are, they're, they're very characteristic of, of public discourse in Argentina, which is quite different from public discourse in Europe. You know, it's, it's much more vivid, it's much more direct, it's much more uh, evocative of things. You know, we're, we're quite moderates in the way we speak, we're modulated, we take care with our choice of words. I mean, it, it, it's different, I think. And, but read, try and see what he's saying. You know, the, it's up there, his, the homilies he gives every morning. They're available on, on, on the, um, on the what, pardon? They're, they're available on some of those websites. The, 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 the ICN. ICN. There's an there's an app you can get called the Pope app for a tuple. Pardon? The Vatican app. The Vatican app. Yeah, that's the one. Not the Vatican rag, but the Vatican app. Okay, <laughs> that's an old-fashioned joke too. Right. Have you got enough advice, please, for going to drink plenty of water, mind where you swim, but get stuck in, and prepare for it by reading the homilies of Pope Francis. So as we were get in tune with the way he thinks. Being a volunteer at SPEC, uh, we do this thing called questions and answers with the kids. Um, and I like, also came to a bunch of conversations with the youth about youth that are already in sexual relationships. And like it's, they're at a point to where they don't really care about what the church says. So what as someone like me, what would I say to that? Well, I think if you take the logic of what, what I was trying to put in front of you, then the point that you want to try and get to is to help them to care about themselves. You know, because in a way, what's at the heart of the church's teaching is about the dignity of each person. And often, the most difficult dignity to find and to acknowledge and to sustain and to act on is the dignity of oneself. It's easy to talk the language of dignity of people over there who might be evidently, you know, uh, unfortunate or needy or whatever else, and we can all get excited about their dignity and therefore their consequent rights. But it's much more difficult, genuinely, to get a grasp of my God-given dignity and how that should mean I should live. And I would, I would think that for many youngsters who get drawn into teenage sex or all the rest of it, it's probably an awful lot to do with a lack of self-confidence and a lack of, uh, as it were, self-worth in themselves. I remember visiting SPEC some years ago now, and, and there were lots of uh, youngsters from school there. And I said to one or two of the leaders, tell me, how is it that some of these girls, excuse me, but it was the girls, 
how is it that some of these girls are we wearing so much makeup and some are wearing none? And I said, can you interpret that for me? And these two young women who were the leaders said this. They said, almost invariably, the youngsters, the teenagers who wear a lot of makeup are insecure in themselves. And so I would, I would try and go down that road. Now, you know, it's, it can be quite delicate, but sometimes I think a very difficult way in is to say things like, what would your mother think? Um, but, but nevertheless, nevertheless, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. Because in a mother's eyes, her child always has worth, always has, is always precious. But that's a very difficult question for a teenager to think. So you might, you know, you might try, what do you think of that when you look in the mirror in the morning? Well, Jen, really seriously, are you being honest in what you're doing? Are you proud of what you're doing? So the, the, I think somehow along the line, you have to get to that point, how that youngster thinks about themselves and whether they see in themselves the, the loveliness and the, 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 the dignity and the worth that God sees in them. And if they can act out of that, then I think their relationships would, they behave differently. I've read catechesis on the basics of sexual morality. Would you be able to explain to us in a few sentences why church teaches contraception is such a great wrong and does so much damage, whereas Catholics struggle to understand why the church teaches Perception is wrong. I think to understand this, um, I would like you to start from the affirmation in church's teaching that the, uh, the vocation, the task of bringing new life into the world uh, carries with it the duty of bringing that life to maturity. So it's not just, to use the phrase, the begetting of children. But it's the begetting, the nurturing, and the education of children. So, given that that's the duty of parents, then within a marriage, there is a right and proper duty of, as it were, shaping a family life so that those responsibilities can be fulfilled. So, there is a, a, a right and a duty to, in a phrase, to act responsibly in parenthood. And that means, normally, limiting the number of children within a family. Um, now, the, then the question becomes, what are the means to be used? Uh, and then you, I think, come to the point uh, of what I was saying earlier on, is that it is of the essence of the gift of a, a, you know, a man and a woman, the mutual gift is that they do not, as it were, withdraw or withhold from the other that which is of the essence of that gift. And that's why uh, the church says, when we understand and use the cycles of fertility as a way of uh, responsible parenthood, nothing is being withdrawn, nothing is being barred, nothing is being, as it were, taken out of the gift of self of one to another. What we're simply using is the pattern of nature, intelligently, sensitively, cooperatively, because that's the great thing about natural family planning, is it actually engages both husband and wife in, in a shared enterprise, whereas within a marriage, uh, other forms of contraception can be simply left as the responsibility of one partner, one or the other. And so in that sense, also become a bit of a dividing line between them. Now, obviously, outside of marriage, kind of the moral considerations are different. Uh, because, well, not, not essentially, but the context is different because the desire to avoid conception is nothing to do with responsible parenthood. It's just to do with trying to get away with something that we shouldn't be doing in the first place. Um, and that's, 
then you know that, that that that's a different kind of situation, and we really should try and address that situation at its root. Okay.